Hello and welcome to Wise Man Channel. Today I was thinking of showing off the latest and greatest with the high tech crack implementations, and I figured the best way to demo this is actually to invite a special guest. So let me introduce to you today our most defined wonderful person, Kevin Sheldrake. Say hi to the audience, Kevin. <laughs> hi. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> awesome to have you. I'm so happy that you could actually do this. Uh, you know, we're having a, a heat wave in Sweden right now, so and I know you're far off from here, and I hope you, you know, manage to sit in and it's a Friday and all of that. So I'm very appreciate that you're here. Yeah, no, that's all cool. We don't have a heat wave here, so um, I'm in the UK for for the. So we're, I don't know, several hundred miles, maybe thousand miles apart. Yeah, and it's kind of good that you are because you know you are the legendary Kevin Sheldrake who actually implemented all the crack attacks from the famous paper "Gone in 360 Seconds." Which is like it's a remarkable paper, but there was nothing implemented that was released. And then all of a sudden, 2017, 2018, some guy showed up, knowing Adam Laurie, and implemented all that crap on his RF Idler stuff. So just let me know. Talk me through that. How did you end up with that? <laughs> okay, so I I was working um, for BT at the time. Um, uh, otherwise known as British Telecom, but I think they just call themselves BT these days, which is a massive uh, telecoms company in the UK. Uh, it was the government owned one um, in the past, and then obviously uh, we, we have you know many different carriers now, but um, but they still own like you know huge infrastructure across the UK, so they they are massive, and they do a lot of uh, enterprise corporate stuff as well. Um, they but they also make a lot of hardware devices. So I was working for BT uh, as a pen tester, cracking hardware devices. So uh, internet routers, phones, cameras, yeah, anything that connected to the internet and ran Linux was pretty much in my game. I tried some, I, you know, I try and attack things that don't run Linux, but I, I'm much better at things that do run, run Linux typically, right? Um, so anyway, so I, was, so I was doing that, but also within that team, they've got massive. Um, penetration testing team. We did a lot of internal work at the time. They're starting to do external work. That there's a red team within there, and their red team is exceptional. They do all. They don't just do the computer side of the red team, and they'll 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 they'll, they'll be able to do pretty much. Any they go and penetrate work. the buildings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and and beyond. I don't I don't want to like steal their thunder by saying the other things that they do. But when they did their training course, they learned a, a lot more than just accessing buildings but oh, yeah. so that, yeah, yeah, in the real world space but anyway uh, they needed to access a building and they knew or they'd worked out that they thought this building had high tag two tags and therefore that this paper might be relevant um and would it be possible and i i was kind of like the the crypto person there um because uh, when I joined BT, um, they they give you quite a lot of time at the beginning, like about six months to get you know to get to know the team and like, sitting on jobs that you're not responsible for and learn what's going on. And in that time, I did a lot of the Coursera training courses. So I did two different crypto courses and then started running the crypto course for other people. And of course, I quite enjoy crypto, right? It's 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 a it's an enjoyable thing. Um, for you have a talent for it. Yeah, I like maths, right? And it's basically just maths. So. Um, so it, was an ob so it was obvious kind of like, you know, I doing some to come to me and to ask me about it. So I did this in my spare time, um, which is why I, I could release uh, the software. Um, but, uh, but, but obviously I could test things based on what, what they were up to. So, um, yeah, spent, spent a long, a long time. Uh, how long so did, how long did you spend on implementing those? How long? Well, so, uh, I, I remember trying to understand the uh, the uh, the algorithm for crack two. Took it took me three weeks just to understand what the symbols meant, and then and then, and then it took like, a few more days to like really grasp what was going on. But for but for about three weeks, it, they made the symbols in the maths made no sense. And I, and, and and maybe maybe one day we'll. Uh, We'll look at. The, in fact, when I when I see you, uh, maybe we'll look at the paper and I'll explain why it's so difficult to understand. But there were there were there were there were like real real things in there. 
but so anyway, I but also I also know Adam Laurie, right, major malfunction. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. With oh, yeah. the paper, I have a I have a theory about the papers. You know, the, oh. we always release those papers, academic papers, but we always introduce errors in it because they don't want you to properly, you know, easily be able to to replicate the work. But you have to be good enough to figure out where they fucked up, where we where they entered the bugs or little mistakes or or they say there's the wrong flip in the in the linear filter or something like that. And it's like ah oh, god. And could, I think you figured that out, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know if there was particularly bugs in this one, but it was but it was just difficult. What all I think ultimately what it came down to was um, th- there were there were a couple of different like variables, and one indicated like a single bit and one indicated like a whole state hmm. of, the LFR, um, of the PONG or the LF, LFSR. And uh, and it wasn't clear that they were different sizes from hmm. the way they were using them. And so it just didn't make sense because you was just like, what, 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 you know, either, either it's like, why, how, how, yeah, you know, where's the rest of the data to make up this thing? And it's like it just doesn't exist. It was just it was just a naming thing. But anyway, regardless, as I say it's it's, <laughs> it's one of those things that makes no sense without actually looking at the paper. And so we're going here. This bit of the maths. This was the bit that was like really. Too. So um, so crack one. Yeah. So so in terms of how long it took. So I knew I knew Adam. I'd known Adam for quite a long time. Um, uh, we both. Uh, it's a long chat. Yeah, we both belong to the same like uh, underground security uh, organization in the UK, where people would come together twice a year and present. In, you know, it's about talk. forty-four one London, or yeah, well, separate to that. So he's got forty-four DC forty-four twenty, yeah. um, which runs monthly in London. But there's this other thing called Uncon, uh, which is the Unconvention, which ran twice a year. And it uh, w- usually uh, one of the meetings would be in London and one of the meetings would be somewhere in the west of England, i.e. I- Cheltenham, Malvern kind of area for, for other reasons to do with government and where people are based, actually, because of that. So, um, so we're both in, we're both going to a lot of those on cons and he presented at them and um, yeah, we, we, we were mates from that. So I'd known him for quite some time. So when I needed to do this thing, I'd already bought an R Fiddler because, um, but when I saw his Kickstarter come up, it was a great idea. Mm. Um, I thought that will probably come in handy one day. And and it kind of did, because you can do this stuff with half Hitler. So um, I, so the scent, so uh, if you don't know what the half Hitler is, right? <laughs> I, I do know, but for our viewers, maybe not knowing. <laughs> yes. Go for it. Yeah. A lot, a lot of the, so hopefully most of the people on the street uh, watching this vi- uh, video will know what Proxmark is. Hopefully. Uh, we can hopefully. hope. <laughs> hopefully. Well, an R Fiddler um, can, is a similar idea, but it only focuses on um, low frequency uh, chips, I believe. Yes, low frequency tech, yep. Yeah, 125 yeah. kilohertz yeah. ish. Obviously, it goes up to about 134 oh. or something like that. Um, and uh, but really, what it what's what's interesting about it is it's it's built on a microchip um, PIC PIC uh, thirty two, if I remember. Yeah, PIC thirty two. And if you look at the board, because it comes as a bare board, if you look at the board, half of the board is basically the PIC thirty two reference design that <laughs> which you could use to test it or build hobbyist things out of. Yeah. And then, and then the other half of the board is the um, the low frequency or the 125 kilohertz kind of front end. Yeah, yeah. The radio part. And they basically hooked a radio part, which is mostly analog, to the PIC32 reference design and then done pretty much everything else in software, which is kind of cool. It's a really, it's a neat way to get, to make a device quickly and have it work. Because otherwise you start with the chip and then you've got to start, you know, designing things that will make the chip work. Well, it's one of the things when I got this, because I got it on Kickstarter as well, 2015, and when I saw it, yeah, I didn't think very much about it back then, because I wasn't doing very much of embedded stuff but that came later on as I learned more. But I always look at it now, and it's like, oh, look, he broke out all the, the pins on the, on the chip. I don't know what I see. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's kind of smart, by the way. And when I look at it today, I say, like, 
damn, he has smart card support here. You know, it's like things that I didn't understand how much actually potential that card uh, has. Laura mm-hmm. Fidley is very potential. He has yeah. both vegan and uh, or smart cards support added to the to the PCB. So that's uh, kind of cool. Exactly, and theoretically, you can you can add on your own yeah. extra hardware, like you would for any other device. You know, and and and, I've, and you can you know, program the firmware to talk to it, which is quite neat. It's very neat. It's a sad thing, though, is that uh, I spoke with Adam as well about this, and uh, it's. Because he's a friend of mine as well, but I don't know him as well as you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I met him at Nullcon and stuff like that, and and I usually say Ooh, hi to yeah. him at Defcon. But anyway, he, he mentioned that it's it's uh, it's not available for sale anymore, so you can't get this device. And which leads me into doing things for the prox market. But rolling back to you again. Um. Yeah. I mean, all I was going to say to them was uh, I can't really. I spent some time, quite some time, trying to get these attacks to work. Hmm. Um, but so I'd, I'd programmed pick chips before, kind of like, um, oh, I can't think of the, the names of them now. Um, but there's, they weren't very powerful pick chips. So they were like for hobbyist projects and things, alternatives to Arduino, but not even as capable as Arduinos. And you pretty much code them in, you know, at the time I was programming in machine code for those. Um, I was making I was, I was making a magic trick that involves having RFID tags inside uh, objects uh-huh. and being able to tell which object was which without looking at it. Um, and a pick chip with a with some sort of RFID front end was mm. a was a kind of solution I had. It for the RFID front end I had wasn't fast enough, so it was a bit. Yeah, it, the project eventually died. Didn't really go where it wanted to go. But it was a I learned a lot about making pick chips do things at the time. So, um, so when you pick up our fridge, and I sp- so I speak to Adam and kind of go, "Hey, um, I want to add functionality to this," and he's like, "Brilliant!" Like no one outside of the team has added functionality. We've had, he said we've had no external PRs on our fiddler yet. I still don't think they've had any since either. <laughs> Not major yet. ones, you know. Your contributions was these gigantic ones, like impressively add on uh, this functionality support for the text. Yes. Otherwise, I think we have minor ones for the Python scripts with doing this graphs. I think yeah, one of the old Proxmark guys did that one. Um, uh, okay, yeah. So, well, that's good. If other people, I mean, but I said at the time, he said like no one, no one did. So he was like all up for it. So, and and then it's like it's basically pick. So he was like, oh yeah. So there's some instructions on like the IDE and stuff. Follow the instructions. You should be able to build a firmware and stick it up. That on, sounds right? like Adam. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. it's, it's all there. So yeah, yes, do it. Exactly. So, it's like, so, so huh. if, you change, uh, if you change the prompt, so instead of saying our fiddler, it says something else, yeah. and build your firmware and put it on the our fiddler, then you'll know instantaneously if it's running your firmware or not. And it's a like, great idea. Okay. So you do that and it works. And you're like, wow. So what I've actually got so is, is like an idea of C code. <laughs> and apart from there's a little bit of restriction on memory. And how you use memory it's it's pretty much just embedded c it's kind of like yeah. you can do you can do almost everything yeah and then you hit a button and wait a co- you know however long and it ends up and your our fiddlers then running running the code like it's so it's kind of it's kind of neat because with the with the prox mic you've got kind of like multiple parts so haven't you there's the arm part and then there's there's, there's, I'm feeling that there's something against Proxmark here. I don't know why. <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's much more complex. <laughs> I don't think so. But no, it, it is. Compared to Arfidly, it is. Arfidly uh, runs on the MCU. Yeah, right. So you yeah. just terminal into that one and you you, you got the serial prompt and that's, everything's there from the beginning. Yeah. Once you flashed it, it's there, running. Simple, easy, right? Proxmark yeah. doesn't have that. We have to have a separate desktop client to talk to it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the, the the idea of trying to implement this on Proxmark at the time was just it was like look at about the, it. You, well, exactly. You just looked at the two and was kind of like, well, I know obviously as I say, I know Adam and and he's happy to support me. And mm. it was like, oh, let's just do that then. So we so that's what we, so that's what we went for. That's why you ended up with Aura Fiddler. All right. Cool. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I don't know how long it took. I mean, probably a few months of evenings 
Um, I think it's pretty much what it kind of came down to. Um, yeah, you to get... made a lot of noise when you released that stuff. You know, you uh, well, the, the impact not... on the community was like, ooh. ooh. <laughs> <laughs> And the funny thing is, it's like, I haven't done anything clever, really. The clever bit was done by the academics. Like, yes, of course. They got here and, and, and voted. I think you cut yourself a little bit short there. You know, you are, you know, uh, you know implementing the academic stuff, it's not fun. It's, it's not easy because... No, it was really hard. <laughs> I, I, I quite happily say it was really hard. <laughs> yes. So, no, don't be like that, man. <laughs> but, um, no, no, no. Yeah. You did well. You did really good. Yeah, but from a... Pro, for, but, yeah, it's like programming, isn't it? Basically, but again, that's the thing. It's like it's understanding what they're, how they describe it. So one of the things I've always said about academic papers, um, but because before reading that, I'd read a number of academic papers in psychology because I have a an interest in hypnosis. For those who don't know, I'm currently currently studying for a PhD in experimental psychology, like part time. That's interesting. Um, yeah, focused on hypnosis uh, and what we call phenomenological control, which is your ability to change your reality to, to be a different reality, which I find really interesting. Um, like as, as in, how does it work? Why does it work? Um, so I'd read a lot of papers. And, and what we always said about papers, uh, and it was just as true about computer science, was academics don't use any spare words. Now, if you if you read an article in a magazine, right, you know, or like you read a book. Oh, the the the, the thesis, the lemmas, you know, the math, the symbols, and it's really crisp, isn't it? It's like mm, yeah, mm. But, there's, but there's no spare capacity in there, so you have to understand every sentence. So normally, when you read something, it says something in a sentence, and then it says the same thing again in a different way, and then mm. it says the same thing again in a in a different way and it, and it builds out this kind of metaphorical understanding of a, of a thing with this stuff it's like no no they every sentence counts and every sentence conveys new information and so if you don't understand one sentence it, it becomes really difficult to understand the whole paper so with psychology yeah. like you you can kind of if you can understand the methods then you can kind of understand the whole paper right and and you can not have to understand every sentence to get what's going on and and, and the relevance but with computer science, kind of important to understand every sentence. Because I'm laughing I'm because I read these damn papers and I didn't understand them. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. There you go. It's 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 real hard work. Ah, um, it takes a while. Yeah, I read them the, several was, times. Yeah, and there was no way to go to ask for help apart from the academics, but um, I didn't. Well, well, I'm a little yeah. bit lucky. So actually, I could chat with, with Rule. So I, I sent him an email and he was like, well, it's all in the paper. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, sir. The thing was, they, they didn't publish their code, yeah. which, were, which actually ran on Foxmark. Yeah. Because they didn't want people to have it, I guess. Yeah. Right? Oh, the, the, so, I think they were um, ball gagged from, uh, from, I think they got a, a court order, right? Uh, yeah, gag so, order, right? Well, yeah. on the yeah. on the mega most we did, and I don't know if we got it from yeah, high tech. So yeah, on the previous one, yeah, yeah they they did, and the and the manufacturer was very upset. This time around, the NXP were perfectly happy with it. They're like, "That's oh, brilliant." We've been telling car manufacturers this for ten years that they need to change to something. Look, we will sell them something else, but they just won't pay for it. Hmm. Uh, but it was Volkswagen that then tried to, yeah, instigated some some kind of law legal action. Um, but I think that was after the paper was published. So I think they'd chosen maybe off the back of the MyFair one not to publish. To I don't I don't know. It's but also think, they, they must have been approached. I mean I know how I have been approached, and so must you. You must have been approached by a lot of people after you did those attacks and and or implemented them. And people always wanted this to be done. And I actually waited deliberately for years because I didn't want to give people too much power <laughs> and stuff. So it's a side thing here about that is around 2019, Adam and you and Philip Turvin, we were on a signal group chat. And I was like, oh, cool about the tags. I want to implement it on the, on the, on the you know, on the, on the Proxmark. And I failed. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, so much bugs still. You know, 2019 in the in the in the Proxmo code was still too many bugs about things, and I didn't do things correctly. And I uh, know you learn. You know, you become better and better and better. Of course. Which leads me today, <laughs> the whole yeah. purpose of this video. <laughs> It is because I ported your code from our fiddler to the Proxmod world. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it works. It does. Or does it? Or does it? Does it? Oh, we were going to look at the bit of code, were we? At some, we were going to look at that function. We're not the, going to look uh, at the code. No, we're not looking at the code again because we did that. <laughs> and I did, a, I did a whole live stream with that like two episodes back. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nasty problems. And then I made another video stream where I actually solved it. That was also four hours, a lot of stuff. But anyway, so yeah, the code runs. <laughs> yes. That's mm. however, the reason why we have is is we're gonna look at it now. And one of the major things with this attack is that it's a, a actually a free part solution for it. You have a, a sniffing part when you sniff an authentication attempt, uh, the nouns and uh, answer from a reader or a tag. Uh, eight bytes, and then you have a uh, online part where you talk to the card only and extract a key stream, two thousand forty-eight bits of key stream, and then you have an offline part where you then look up in the in this gigantic one point two terabyte of lookup file, which takes at least forty-eight twenty-four to forty-eight hours of, of generation, and then you can extract the key from it. So the reason why I wanted you to be here today is we actually want to demonstrate that you don't have to be physically at the same place when you do this. So when you do the offline part, someone else can do it for you. So how about we just try to look into the two second parts of, of, of uh, three steps because I already sniffed. I'm not going to go to the car and sniff again. Now, I'm not going to even do that because I'm going to do this one. So we're just going to take a, a, a normal card and we're going to do the, the already found nouns and uh, answer and use that and to extract the key bit stream. And then uh, I'm going to send it over to you to see if you can crack it or look it up. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, indeed. Let's do it. Let's do it. I, don't, I, I know we cut a little bit short about the academic, academic papers about that, but I think we covered it a little bit. So let's, let's go and, you know, we demo some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can always talk about uh, how, how the table is so complicated afterwards. This is, uh, it's all been pushed, the code, the porting of the, of the code has been pushed to the Proxmark repo, and you, you can pull the latest and compile it and you will have it. So what we do have here is a um, tag with a known default key because it's much easier to verify that way so we don't have yes and it's a little bit cheating you can say but yeah that's how it works. There are actually two cracks that's um, that or uh, Kevin did actually three attacks and we're gonna see how I implemented it in the Proxmark world because I I'm not decided yet how it's gonna look like but uh, let me just show you the first part how it looks like, and then we can talk about it. Uh, cool. Yes. So what you do is you don't under LF high tag. Oh, wait. Right. Let's let us listen. Look. It's under LF high tag, and it's a new uh, subsession called recovery. And it's not crack two because that's for crack out two. I have hidden this. The crack one is under the dump uh, command. So. Under the LF high tag dump, you can do help text and you can see that you can call it with NRAR. By the way, because of these attacks that you implemented, <clears throat> you can see that, you know, high tag 2 has password, which is 4 bytes, and a crypto key, which has 6 bytes, and, you know, supposed to be more secure. But based on the idea of how, how this cracks works, you can actually see that if you take that sniff data, you can, you can treat it like you have a key in, in a way that you use it in a client. So I'm just going to use it, you know, like a parameter into a dump command and it will run that part of the crack out of a box. And it looks like this. Uh, I call it challenge mode, uh, NRAR. What does AR so Answer reader? Um, so... Yeah, so it's uh, nonce and must be answer. Answer, well, it's got to be answer, isn't it? Yeah. So it um, takes about ten seconds, and if you want to walk through me uh, what it does, you can go ahead and do that. 
how this works. Yeah, so this is quite it's, it's quite interesting. Um, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> with with high tag two, uh, the way it works is uh, the tag enters the field that's uh, you know modulated at one hundred twenty five kilohertz, and that energizes the tag, and the reader. Um, modulates the field so to give to send out the bit pan i think it's one one zero 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 yeah which is like this five bit bit pan so and if there's a tag um energized in the field and uh, when it sees that which is this known as start off it tells the tag to respond with its uid so it uh it modulate the tag modulates the field with its 32 bit uid and then the, <coughs> the reader can kind of get that um so then the reader um you know, a system is set up to be password or crypto mode. Now, you, you, there's no hybrids. So if it's in crypto mode, which is what we're talking about here, then um, it will then challenge uh, the, the tag to prove that the tag is part of the system. And yes. the kind of way it does that is it is it issues an NRAR, so a nonce, an encrypted nonce and an, in, and an encrypted answer to the challenge. Yes. Um, so the uh, the reader has set up its pseudo random number generator, which is an LFSR, which is a linear feedback shift register, which is a particular type of PRNG. Um, so it can it configures that with the key, which the card and the reader both know, and um, the encrypted nonce that it's generated, and then it um, and then it uses the output of that. PRNG, uh, which is like which we would call a key stream, and it simply XORs that with anything it wants to encrypt and sends yeah. it back. The tag, meanwhile, has oh, and the UID. Oh, sorry. So when it sees the random number generator, it's also the UID. So it's yeah. the UID, the key, and the nonce, the encrypted nonce. So for people to follow along, this is like the memory output. So High Tech Two has eight blocks of four bytes of data, whereas Block Zero is the UID and these parts here is actually the password and key and then when you do an authentication attempt it returns the config block three here or it's, a, it's block number four but we call it block three because it's zero indexed and if you just want to look at the data i also did the annotations for it so uh oh not for this one sorry <laughs> that's alive uh you can see it for this one um for the attack if it done a normal if i would have authenticated with a password uh, you would have seen it so if i do, ooh, I do dump, dump, uh, crypto if i do this instead i can do it like this here a little bit too big so i will make my uh, terminal a little bit smaller and i will do it again okay i will do this again so this is how it looks like there <clears throat> and you can see then you have your startup uh, command that kevin was mentioning with 11000. Here's the UID that comes from the tag, and then we send the encrypted nonce, NRAR. And since we do know this is the default key, we can actually test it, and that's why we can see which key is used here. And this means this is the decrypted stream that was. So here's the encrypted data stream, and this, since we did know the key, we can actually decrypt it on the, on the go, see what's sent here. So you can follow the whole authentication process and you can look at the high tech protocol, which is, is a good way of learning things. But yes. Yeah, it's really, really good. It's like, it's nice to sort of see. Like, it'd be, it kind of come in handy to, if you want to understand how it works. Yes. Um, but, but essentially the tag sets up its random number generator using the same data in the same way as the reader has. And then uh, either one of them can like get a load of, Bits from the key from the PRNG, load like keystream, encrypt, um, XOR their plain text with it to make it encrypted and send it to the other party. The other party can get the same number of bits out of their random number generator and XOR that with the encrypted, and that will give them back the plain text, which is basically stream cipher kind of 101. You you basically take your plain text, XOR it with some keystream, that makes it encrypted, take the encrypted, XOR that with some with the same key stream and that gets you back to the plain text and that's the fundamental under uh, crypto underneath what's going on yeah and um, um, the particular bug or uh, the attack in the crack one is if i uh, you know if i allow myself to say there is that you do an extension of these commands here the read command along with the encrypted 
uh, key stream to recover enough data for a read page and try to figure out which page to read. So you generate all these read commands, but you extend it so it fits into the 32 bits plus 10 for the answer, uh, something like that. Or correct me, how, it, how yes. does track one work? <laughs> and that's basically right. Uh, ba basically, a, a command in high tag two is five bits long, typically. Um, yeah. Or for the for the shortest, com the shortest one you can actually send is ten bits because it's it's it has um it's normal command and then the inverse of the command where every yeah. one everyone is a zero, right? So the shortest command you can physically send is ten bits. So what but, you send is, is like this. This is what always is sent. Like this is the wake up command. So this is ten bits. So one one and three zeros, and then it's the inverse. Oops, not the inverse, right? Not reverse. <laughs> it's a good one, yeah. Yeah, like this. No. <laughs> no. 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 Here you go. Here you go. There you go. Here right. You go. Like that. right. Inverse. Um, yeah. <laughs> I blame and the this, heat. <laughs> and, and so this is a level of integrity provided in the system in order to be able to check that the first one is the inverse of the second one. Ah, because yeah. It, so that's the it, CRC, basically, right? Exactly, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a simple thing. And then to, to provide more integrity, which makes little sense in in any world apart from in the world of NXP, high tag two, uh, you can actually send more versions of the command and you just alternate whether or not they're inverted or not. But it so, makes sense, though, the extended one. You know, if it's a noise way and have a bad reader and in the bad situations, you would like to add extended key streams like that. So this is what happens is that you can actually prolong. This does the exact same thing if you send this as the first one, which is just yeah. this. This is the whole basis of that, is that they allow this extension of the command set to be sent, which is mm -hmm. kind of odd, but I understand the, the decision why to do it, you know, because the, the, the antennas on a key fob, like what you put in a car in the ignition, is, is really small, and if, if that's not really good matched, you still want it to work. So it makes sense in one way. But it... But it, uh, it yeah, I mean, what it does is it provides more in, more integrity in the sense that it's less likely to work. <laughs> but you're but you but you've got less chance of doing the wrong command. Yeah. Yes. Which, right. Because it, because basically, there's more bits. It, 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 the longer you're, that that command is, if any one bit has been. Finished, yeah, that's where it fails, right? Because. Then, it would be okay if uh, one 10 bits, if I sent 40 bits and 10 bits was okay, it was like, okay, that's okay. But it demands that all 40 bits is okay. Exactly. So, so, you're, so you're basically saying, I really, really, really want this communication. So, so I guess what you're, the risk that you're mitigating is that you have two glitches, one in the first five bits and one in the second five bits, uh, exactly the right points that matching bits flip together. Yeah, to make the command still valid, but not the command that you intended. That's what you're kind of mitigating it by extending it further. But I think that's such a small chance that that would occur that I don't. Anyway, who cares? Who cares? It's I don't know why, but they did. They not, did. Yeah, we're not fixing the design. We're just <laughs> <laughs> we are saying that that's the course, or that's what the academics was figuring out. And with yeah. it, they made this lovely thing and. For me to use it in, in the Proxmog world, it's like, yeah, but it's just, it's like a key. It's just, it's eight bytes instead of six bytes, <laughs> which is just, just bizarre in the way you can think about it. It's how weak the whole crypto is because of the, the authentication part becomes because of it. So it, it takes 10 seconds to extract all the, the key bits uh, needed to dump the data when we do it like uh, this. The question is, there's a specific reason why you would use the crack one versus the crack two attack. Uh, yeah, so with so with crack one, it's using a, a length extension attack on the known key stream in order to give in order to encrypt commands and and interrogate the the tag with actual, with commands to read the different pages and. Well, that's great for pages four, five, six, and seven, which are the user pages. Yeah, this um, is the user pages. If yeah. you want to clone the tag, you probably want the key, which is in uh, pages one and two, and the config byte 
uh, config data in page three. Yeah. And those pages can be read locked. Yes. So, so that you can't, uh, so, even though you can, got the you know, even though you're communicating encrypted with it, it just refuses to give the data. So in this case, this card is configured for read write. Would you would you see here for um, page uh, or block the one, two, and three? But these these ones could be uh, locked or read only in that sense. Uh, not even that. You wouldn't get anything out from it. So you wouldn't get the key, so you couldn't make a perfect clone of it. And that's when uh, the Crack 2 comes to play, right? Yeah, so with, so with Crack 2, if you imagine in order to do Crack <coughs> 1, you, you basically extend the command to be about 100 bits long to get about 100 bits of key stream, so you can then ask all, all the questions that you want to ask and get answers for. You can extend that command as many times as you like, apparently indefinitely. Uh, which is incredible, um, and so you can you can do the same thing from crack one, where it's where it's recovering keystream using the extension attack to extend it to get a lot of keystream. Yeah. Um, so I what so the i the idea of the attack, right? If, if you imagine there's a the idea is that you get some keystream, and you have a huge table of all the keystream possible. Yeah, and every one of them links to the state that the uh, internal random number generator was in at that particular moment when it generated that keystream. And then what you could do is you could take any keystream, including like the AR value, which is um, I think that's the in I think it's the inverse of of all. Yeah, I think it's like um, that's that's basically the inverse of keystream uh, because the AR value is un unencrypted is all ones. So yeah. it gets XOR to the keystream. So what, what you've got is flipped keystream, inverse keystream. You can take that four bytes of keystream and basically say, what states generate this keystream? And get back a number of states. You get back about 64,000 states, 65,000 states. And then you could see which of those states actually matches up. And only one of them will. And then you'd have the key. The reason why you can do that is because we know the UID and the AR and the linear shift register, linear feedback shift register, of the PND is reversible. So you can actually roll it back and roll it forward. And then you can actually roll that one backwards and you can see if it matches the UID. So you can try to encrypt or create a situation for the crypto engine startup and see if it generates the same key stream. And yeah. once you do that, you can roll back and get the key out of that. Exactly. So the problem is, if we wanted to have a table of every um, state that the that it could be in, that table would be too big. It would be yeah. in the petabytes size, which is incredibly big, and no one can be bothered to make it, let alone has yeah, that match. Because it's a 48-bit yeah. crypto, so yeah. Yeah, so you don't want to do that. So instead, the other extreme could be to just do a brute force attack. Uh, and just try so from what key stream you have, try and and uh, every key until you find keys that match, and then and find if they which is which is the subject of other cracks where um, there's a um, you know GPU accelerated crack. That's the what we call the crack number five. Crack so, number five, right? Crack That's the other thing. So this uh, this crack, crack mm. two, is kind of a halfway house between the two. Mm. The idea being that. Um, the table's too big, so let's make a smaller table. So a reasonable size table. If you, what you can do is just just keep halving the size of the table until it comes down to something that you can actually physically fit on a hard disk, oh, and yeah. therefore have a confidence that you could actually build in a reasonable amount of time. So and the answer they came to was about one point two terabytes. So, so, so this is about a little. It was kind of popular for a couple of years back. You know, rainbow tables. If you if you're old enough for that once. Yeah, uh, and people keep on mentioning that this is a rainbow table. I'm like, this is similar, but it's not quite. It's not. It's not a rainbow table. No, yeah, that, that, that misunderstands. It's not so a Markov the, chain. That's what I'm trying to say. It's. Uh... Yeah, the problem. The, <laughs> exactly. The problem. The problem with uh, is that rainbow table as a as a term, who has become to mean a large lookup table that you can use as part of an attack as mm. opposed to what it originally meant in, in in the very strict sense of what why a rainbow table made sense so 
I mean, the reason why a rainbow shaver made sense is because of the multiple hashing of, of the answers. And so you've only got to find one of those hashes in your table, and then you can walk onwards from there and, and get to the answers really quickly. So, um, so, so you didn't, you don't need to have all of the hashes in the table. You just need to have enough of the hashes in the table that the one that you have is in the, is likely to be in the table. Yeah. Because from there, you can then work out what's gone up. So this is not a rainbow table in that sense, but it has that same kind of feel, which is we don't have all the states. We have one 2048th of the states. So yeah. here, instead of 48, bit, you know, instead of two to the 48 states, we have two to the 37 states. Um, so the idea being, if you could get 2048 bits of key stream, then going from start to finish one of those bits of key stream should be in our table that's kind of awesome isn't it yeah be, be, by definitely yeah be, because that's so, so um what that means is that we our table when it contains two to the 37 states every state needs to be 2048 states apart yeah and then, and and that way you cover enough of the space that with 2048 bits of key stream one state in there will be in your table and then that's how you can break the break the bank okay cool so that's the background about it so let's see how it looks like uh, yeah. we implemented it uh, in the high tag uh, sub commands uh, as crack 2 and if we read the help text it just says that it tries to recover a whole heap of crypto stream data and you call it with uh, an NRAR like we did for the DOM command. So if I'm just taking this one, change it to crack2, and run it, we see if, oops, that's wrong. <laughs> Don't do that here. And do it like this. We try to see if we can uh, execute it. Yeah. So this one a little bit more verbose because it takes such a long time to run. It takes about 28 to 30 seconds to execute as you start from zero and try to send all the bits out. I had some fun when we did this last stream in looking and sniffing on the data and you can actually see the, the transmission of the data becoming longer and longer and longer. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was hilariously fun. So 30 seconds and we extracted the data. The data what you see what's need to be sent out or used for lookup in the table that uh, Kevin was just mentioning is this this is the data here and <clears throat> we implemented this high tag to crack and search and look up it's under the tools high tag to crack crack to and there's also readme files so you can actually see what it does but it wants a file and i'm pretty sure it wants a text file so you just enter like this i'm not sure if you want a binary file so i haven't run that one because i don't have a database i don't have 1.2 terabytes of data however there is a person here in this stream or this video that does have it. And this is when we can run this as offline. So I will send this to Kevin and we will swap over to his terminal. And voila, what you're seeing now is Kevin's uh, terminal. Yeah. So you, Kevin, take it away. Okay, so I have, I have a couple of files here. Um, the first one is the same keystream that Iceman sent me by email. Um, obviously, other secure communication methods are available. Um, but uh, so all I've done is paste that he's, he's he sent it to me as a file. I've just saved that. That's all it is. It's exactly the same format of characters as as came out of the proxmark. It's a textual file. Okay, great. Okay, so so there's nothing clever about that. Um, I've named it with the UID of the tag and the NR that was used to uh, generate that uh, in the command uh, because we're going to need both of those uh, in order to crack it. Yeah, and um, just to mention it like this, uh, in the in the, in the Proxmark world, we tend to do things a little bit more stupid sometimes because we don't really want to be, you know, compliant when you do things. So the, the nouns that is very randomly selected in this case that is used 
the proxmog world is all zeros. So, yes, you know. <laughs> so that's why it says zeros in the name uh, on the file there. Yeah, yeah. So the, so the nonce in this case was zeros. But if you'd sniffed one, yeah. that would be the sniffed nonce in there um, with the UID of the tag that you, and, and the key string that came out. So uh, what I also have in this directory is a directory called sorted. And if I look in sorted, you'll see it's like, there's a directory in there for every possible uh, 8-bit value. And if I look inside any one of those, there's um, uh, 256 files in there, um, each with a, with a the, uh, you know, so, um, and then each of those contains data. And we'll talk about the data afterwards if you want, but they're basically states. How large are those bins? bins? Oh, you can have a look. Um, 20 meg, oh. roughly. Um, so you can multiply that and work out how big the table is. So what you do need to have is like a fast solid state disk or a, what do you call this, NWE RAM things. Yeah. M2 drives. No, that would probably be the, the better place to build it, not a spindle, which is what I did. And it's it's extremely slow. Um. But I, 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 I mean, I have had some thoughts about how you could make this faster, possibly. But who, who cares? Doesn't matter. Point is, there's a table stored in the directory sorted. Um, now, um, if I was to, I have got. Uh, yeah, usually or a bit of error because well, that's where the source code, code from. Half, the original, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter because it's C code and it runs. It'll be exactly the same, right? Yep. And I've compiled uh, how to crack to search. And what that's asking for is the file, the UID, and the NR. So the file is that. And then the UID and the NR are just cheap, right? Because that's why I haven't this file name, because it's really easy to paste in. So, so, that, so it's. So it's got the file with the key streaming, 2048 bits of key streaming, um, ascii hex. Uh, it's got the UID which of the tag from which the key stream was grabbed, and it's got the NR that was used in order to grab that. And so we run that, and... Wow. Wow. Because of the magic <laughs> of modern-day Linux, that happened instantaneously. <laughs> wow. But in actual fact, that took... You know, that would have taken, I don't know, 10 seconds or 20 or, or 15 seconds or something to have done. It's just that um, somewhere either in the kernel or in my file system that is cached from when I ran this the other day. So uh, <laughs> the, the <laughs> magic of cache. Exactly. exactly. And I don't turn my PC off unless I have to. So that that's uh, that stays on. So that Everybody would... finds these outputs very, very sexy. Don't look, you, know, you see this, you know, all oh, cracking bits and all that stuff, you know. Yeah, and and generally it's all here for debugging purposes. Yeah, this this is something that I would have, I was doing manually. So I was using the R Fiddler's implementation of the PRNG from High Tag Two, which pre existed before I was doing the cracking, because it can it can you know it can emulate a reader, it can emulate a tag, etc. Right? Um, I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if tag emulation ever. No, they never got to tag emulation. They got reader emulation. But anyway, regardless, they had the RNG implementation in there. So what I could do is I could use that code, which I pulled out of the uh, Fiddler repo, to have a desktop uh, PRNG, and I could put it in any state I like, and then I can do stuff to it, and I can see what happens, and I can trust that implementation because we know it works on the R Fiddler. Hmm. But a lot of this kind of output um, is me getting out the kind of stuff that I need to compare side by side with a Ah, I feel you, brother. I feel you. <laughs> I know. I do the same thing, man. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also it's a little bit so, sexy. You know, you have to admit it. It's a little bit sexy to see those. Yeah, so, so, I mean, good data always looks sexy. Yeah. yeah it, that's yeah. it helps. Like, you know, this is what you do when you, you know, try to figure shit out and you're like, I would have needed a printed out, you know, the bit clips here. I need to know that, you know, because then I can manually see things. Yeah. So, what it's doing is it takes. Um, it takes the keystream and it slides through the keystream using a sliding window 
uh, one bit at a time. So there's 2048 bits in there. So if you take 48 off that, uh, there's 2000. I don't know. That's a good point. Maybe we maybe we should have more key stream. Maybe this is a risk. Maybe there's a small risk. Maybe you need to go 2048 plus. Um, well, I don't know if it takes 30 seconds to collect the data from the card. Bits. It doesn't yeah, take think, too long time to execute that one. I think we should technically have another 48 bits or 47 bits in order in order to have 2048 potential goes. So there's a so maybe there's a very small possibility. I don't know. Someone, one of your viewers, will clearly explain this mathematically why it doesn't why we don't need the extra bits. Anyway, Please let us know in the comments below if you're feeling it and you want to explain to us why we would need 47 bits more of data and keystream data. Yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, for every one of those potential, every one of those bits of keys, yeah, you know, 48 bit windows of keystream from that file it looks them up and it uh, so basically if you take the first byte that tells you the first directory within the sorted directory the second byte tells you which file you want to be opening and then in there um if you mem and memory map that into memory it's basically a table or with a four byte uh key and a six byte oh no and a, it's got a 10 byte entry I believe. No, maybe it's a six by entry. I can't remember. No, no, you have to give him a break. You know, it was like seven years ago we did this. So that's right. No, it is. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. So it's the last four bytes of the state, and it's the six bytes is the key, and the six bytes is the value. And it's so there, there are entries in a struct, in a 10 byte struct, which makes up a, a sorted table. And so you can then take your four bytes from your key stream. And then you can and you can just do a B search on it. And it'll, it'll instantaneously tell you if it's in there or not. I think it's in a beautiful attack, and you made a beautiful implementation of it, man. Yeah. And then once you've got the state, you can then roll the state all the way back. Yeah. And when you get all the way back to the key, you can XOR some of that with the uh, with the NR to decrypt the uh, use the NR as the decryption to decrypt the key. So the question is, is the key that you found there the same as it is on the card? Well, indeed. We have this is the card, and it says 4F4E. 4D, 494B52, and it looks yep. kind of like what you have there. And that, that, and that is the key, which is the default key, but, uh, but that is the key off the, off the tag. Yes. Um, so, it, so it just, yeah, so it kind of, so it just works. It's quite... It's quite neat as an offline attack. So the online bit takes what thirty seconds, and then the off and the, well, obviously the sniff. You gotta sniff it first. Thirty seconds online, and then I don't know. 30 yeah. Seconds so online. sniffing is against you know a reader or card or you know reader key fob, so you get an authentication attempt there. You might be able if you have a simulation, so you can simulate a tag. You would extract the same data out of it. We need two genuine NRARs. In this case, you only need one, but if you want to do the GPU attacks, you would need two. So it goes pretty fast to extract the sniffing data once that's in place. And uh, the problem we have is, of course, sniffing sucks right now, both on our Fiddler and our Fiddler is better, but the Proxmox sniffing sucks. Uh, so oh. it's not good. And then once you have that, you need to talk to the card reader. I use my little extension here when I want to do the attacks against the key fob and, and put it in there and in that little group there. It's also kind of annoying, but <clears throat> it is what it is. Maybe one of these days someone improves it even better. So that's uh, 30 seconds. And then your lookup part there, once you've done the table, that's the time memory trade-off. Once you've done it, that's once, you know, you do that once for 24 hours and then you just make lookups and then it takes like 5 to 10 seconds or is it 700 yes, bits, 10 seconds, but it would be 30 seconds for about 2,000 bits, right? Yeah. Maximum. Yeah, yeah and, and obviously some of that depends on what media it's the, the files are on and, and what kind of processor you've got. But it's, but it's like, it's t I mean, it's, it's negligible. Yeah. No one's caring. You know, it's not a Mission Impossible situation where, you know, you have to have that door open in 10 seconds. It's like, well, <laughs> you know. The fun thing is, like, what could you do with this one? I mean, the, the reason is that you can extract the key from here now. So even if that were a locked blocks, like we talked about before, you would have had the key and, and you know, you could fill it in with the data that is needed. 
Um, yes. So of course, yeah, yeah. making a copy of a key fob. Is that what the purpose of this, or what's the big? That's what, that's what we were doing. Yeah, no, that was that was our our thing was to copy a tag so that we could people could access the building. And so, um, so what I then built <laughs> was, uh, and this went through num numerous prototypes. All right, go. The, the thing I can't remember what it's called, right? Because uh, it's been too long, and I've done too many other things since. But there's a car. Someone's got a car park. RFID reader, which is about 30 centimeters by about 30 centimeters. And uh and if you um if you hook into it with a microprocessor of some sort or whatever, Arduino, whatever you like, and then you put that inside a bag and power it with batteries, right? You've got a quite a powerful RFID reader, which within range of 30 centimeters, maybe up to maybe further than that, 60 centimeters. Yeah. from this bag you can read people's dumb rfid tag low frequency rfid tags i think it's yeah. low frequency I Wh think whichever it is. That, that's what we call today uh, weaponized readers yeah it's a concept for it so yeah exactly so so i built a weaponized reader for high tag 2 oh, which yeah. is far more complicated it turns out than than just a normal weaponized reader because you've got to be able to do this two directional bi-directional conversation yeah. Um, and you, you need to, uh, you need to, so you, yeah, because you're in an authentication process, you know, a weaponized reader, what we, what they are talking about is that you add on to vegan data ports from yeah. the reader and read just the, one of the credential was sent over the, the vegan. We are obviously in Kevin Sheldrake's, you know, man cave where he has all his gadgets. This is exactly where we are. <laughs> But I'm not finding the thing I'm looking for, which is kind of annoying. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, we'll cut this out. <laughs> cut it out. Cut it out. Yeah, no, so it's a bit sad. I um, so this this is my R fiddler. Uh, so it's, in, it's still in the box it came in. Um, probably just given away an old address that I no longer live at. Um, one that is actually on the internet anyway, so I don't really feel too bad. But, uh, might have been given away but inside inside the box Ooh. Ooh. so um, ah, no, you used it like that okay and i would pop this uh, so the uh, the antenna attaches to a couple of pins uh, here yeah and then and then that could come out of the box as well and you could so the things you could right but the antenna the nice thing about knowing the guy who made it is that he tells you how to wind antennas um so I got myself a uh, LF, uh, what, I can't remember, what are they called? Micro L VNAs. LCR meter. It measures inductance as well as capacitance and resistance. Yeah. So if you know the inductance, which you can measure, you can then make your own one. So I, I made, I made, um, I made some with which were like sort of that sort of size, like uh, how big would you say that is? Like. Oh, 20 centimeters. It's maybe? enormous. It's yeah. So all, all you do is you go looking around your house and your shed and your garage, looking for round things like paint pots. I love um, it. Uh, saucepans from the kitchen, right? Uh, washing basket, anything that's round, right, yeah. of different sizes, but that you could wind something on. And then you just get the right kind of wire and then you just wind it. And then you make a guess, you measure it. And then you make another guess from that. You wind another one until you basically get to a point where you can wind one and it come off with the same inductance as that coil has. Uh, but they're, now they're all different sizes. I mean, the one that came off the washing basket was like 40 centimeters in diameter. Holy that God. never worked. There was, a, <laughs> there, was, there was no point at which I could get a card to work with it, with that one. Because clearly there wasn't enough power, right? Because this is USB powered, right? So yeah. there's not much current going into this. So, so the antenna can only draw so much blah, right? Yeah. Physics gets in the way. But the one that was about 15 centimeters or 20 centimeters, something like that, um, that worked quite well. And uh, you could get you could get a distance of several centimeters, like maybe 10 centimeters from the coil where you could pick up the tag which is kind of enough to conceal that in like a clipboard 
Um, well, well, as long as you talk to the card, yes, you can get the distance, but you still need to sniff it from a, from a genuine reader. How do you do that? Oh, right. Okay. Well, there's, there's multiple. So, so what you re, what you, the first thing you want is a, you want a valid UID for a tag that you know of, right? Hmm. So, if you have a target, a person, a particular person, or you don't care who the target is, but you have, but you have access to a number of people who also have access to this building. So, for example, foyer, lobby, lift were the, were the kind of areas where lift is great because it's a real crunch point where you can get quite close to other people without anyone really caring. So, if you've got your technology built into something like a clipboard that you just happen to have, uh, another one I did was in a rucksack that sits behind you, for example, right? All you've got to do is bump into someone who's got their badge with their mm. eye tag on right around their neck, right? And yeah. you get the new ID, but as long as you know who it is, then you can go and use your R Fiddler. You've, I don't know whether you can do this with Proxmark now or not, but you but you go and pretend to be that UID to the... Oh, yeah, really simulation. Right okay, yeah. And that will give you an NRAR value. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Then the next time you bump into this person... The same person which you know the you idea of you've got an nrar now so now you can attack the tag yeah and um and that will give you most of the tag like if you say we crack one you might get the whole tag it depends on whether they're in, whether they've yeah that only takes 10 seconds to be in the field um, yeah this one here demands right up against someone that's that's doable right yeah even this even crack two 30, 30 seconds if you're in a lift for long enough and you're up against them yeah like, you know, that that's that's probably just about doable. No, the question is, <clears throat> I have a following up question, because this is extremely interesting, and I think it's, like, amazing what you've done. I can really tell that you've been pen testing and red teaming like crazy. But uh, I, what I am a little bit interested in is how many uses high-tag in crypto mode like that as an access control system? Because I haven't seen that. I only see it packed on them. They use it in, in PVD mode. Otherwise, what I've seen is in key car key fobs. But. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I believe it was popular in higher security or organisations that had was had a slightly higher security consciousness than <laughs> than to use something off the shelf. Really? <laughs> to mean, find higher. <laughs> well, well, uh, I mean, indeed. The, I mean, it's a lot easier to attack a Paxton. Yes. Like than it than it is to attack this. Like this. This and more of this attack was uh, before this was published by the author yeah. there was a known brute force by um oh, i can't think of the name of the paper but it came out before this paper um yeah, so, I, if you could, so if you could get, get a couple of nrars for a uid you could uh, you could brute force a key out of that which would take a long time at the time using gpu but obviously nowadays it's a lot quicker and obviously later attacks even more impressive because what he references is that, you know, uh, when people said that the high-tech crypto uh, was published, whatever it is, it was published somewhere around 2006, 2007 in, in some uh, underground forums uh, by someone called IC Wiener. And I looked at that implementation and I realized, holy fuck, that guy actually, imp or woman, I don't know, uh, implemented a uh, bit-sliced implementation of a brute force. And I'm like, that is someone really smart who released that code. Bit sliced implementations of crypto is very rare to see, and it takes a certain mindset to do it. And we saw that 10 years later by another guy who's exceptionally good at doing bit sliced attacks. He improved the hard nested attack for Micro Classic. Uh, yeah, his professor happened to be the guy that wrote the Gone Inferno in 60 seconds. But he, you know, when I look at his code, he's like, ah, it's. It's very similar to the other brute, uh, bit sliced implementation. Uh, and it's amazing. So if you're into knowing more crypto and, and understanding bit sliced and all that stuff, you can look at those original design and, and things. I actually talked to Adam about this and said, the reason why I managed this time to port your code into the Proxmark world is that actually I had to walk back into our fiddle code looking at and didn't match up and then he had a test self test command where here's a link to that icv in a paper or that blog original right. the code is so yeah. i went back in that code and i looked in 
how he actually gave a uh, suggestion how the UID is flipped or key and the key stream is flipped. And I was like, ah, oh, motherfucker. That is why it looks like so crazy in the Proxmox code because those flips. Uh-huh. And because of his old documentation n- led to a base that I actually managed to port your code. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, Isn't that fun? <laughs> I mean, it, well, it is. And it, and it is really interesting as a, as a thing. I mean, and, and also the challenge to the anyone watching, um, actually, um, at the time, at the time when I, when I implemented Crack 2, you got to make that table, right? And that table needs to be sorted. So you, and verified. So, yeah. So you start at one state, and then you can jump 2048 states and, and get the key stream from there, and then continue and continue and continue, right? So, but you've got to sort it on the key stream. So I asked a lot of people, how do you do this? Like, how do you go about it? And, and they were like, well, you know, you have a sparse table. And like, okay, okay, so the sparse table is petabytes in size, right? So you're like, so you can't do that in any way, shape, or form. So, um, so you're like, well, um, can you build it and then sort it? And you're like, you can, but it's 1.2 terabytes. And that and disk space at the time was a bit, you know, was it was a thing. But even so, there's a time to invite stuff to disk and get stuff off disk, right? So, so that's that's expensive. Um, and that's the naive approach was basically what I ended up taking. But I was like, what else is there? And people were like, what? Oh, sticking it in a database. The database didn't work. And so you're kind of like, okay, well, I know there's two to the power of 37 insertions. <laughs> so I can look up at, look up what how what's the fastest a database can do batch insertion. And you go, oh, that's going to take a week. Like that's, you know, this is going to take two days. That's going to take a week. Like it's, it's so database, I think, is off the table. I think really... The answer I think makes the most sense to me right now is you have a two terabyte or more uh, SSD set up as swap, which is usually a very bad idea for lots of reasons to do SSDs, but you set it, but it's temporary, right? And then, and then you memory map. Or maybe you can just memory map a file. Because you did a, a, a very ni- a nice little trick, which, which I'm now looking into as well, uh, is when you mem map. Uh, uh, it's a oh, C yeah. command to, to map a part of memory to a file. So or it gives you a file handle, and all of a sudden it's like reading it from memory. It's, 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 it's very much better than reading like we do otherwise. We read, read, read bytes, but like that. It's very slow. So this is a very fast way to read in large chunks of data. So. It's a nifty so, speed up trick that you used there. I liked it. Yeah. Uh, I, I noticed it and I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's good. I use it wherever I can. Imagine if you could memory map the entire table. Mm. But the you table. You RAM memory for it. But you don't have enough RAM for that, right? Yeah. It's terabytes. But if you, but, so if you have swap. Yeah. Uh, maybe or maybe you don't even need to. Maybe the maybe the thing is clever enough to do it anyway. But but if you did it along those lines, so it's backed as a file on some very fast storage like SSD. The thing is, you already sorted it, and you sorted by the first byte, right? And then that will cut down a, uh, at least by two to the power to thirty six, mm. right? You could you could insert it as a as a hash. You you could make a hash on that tape if you could. Yeah. You could arguably, get that space. So yeah. So maybe maybe you can make a fake file on the SSD that is, you know, two terabytes or whatever. Oh, but we're and talking about the map. about the generation of it. Of this yeah, file, the generation. Right? Yeah, because the, the generation. lookup it doesn't take a long time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, everything is everything is geared towards the lookup being fast, which is why it's going to be sorted. Yeah. But the generation, it's it's all about um, how long it takes and how much space it needs. So, so anyway, if anyone has a better solution, I'm always interested in. It's, it's, it's a nonsense problem now because we have much better attacks um, than this. That, so we don't really need crack two. Um, oh think. yeah, uh, for for reference, uh, the GPU yeah. attacks. If you have it on proper modern GPU, it takes about uh, seven to sixteen seconds, and you only need uh, two uh, nonce uh, NRAR 
and to run it. So you, then you only need the access to, you know, the sniffing to get the nouns data, and then you have yes, card only for seven to sixteen seconds. I think so, you need, um, but, but you get you the key out. Two, yeah, you probably need two NRARs, yeah, don't you? You need two, yeah. yes. Because otherwise, it, so it doesn't so that's resolve. the reference what where where we are today. Uh, so, yeah. but it's still very interesting. To see this, it's a very good of learning. So, for ref uh, for you who are watching it, I will highly recommend to watch your videos from uh, your talks about this 2017. I watched them both of them. Uh, one way a little bit hangover the day after, but I in tremendously enjoyed listening to you because you're very very good in explaining this utterly completely complex matters. And you're doing it in a fun way. So uh, go and watch his videos and uh, subscribe to his Twitter and all that stuff. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm glad to have you here, man. I'm really yeah, happy. No, no, it's, it's, been really, it's, it's, it, it's really nice to see that it's available on Proxmark. Because obviously with our fiddler not being available, obviously Proxmark is much more useful for other things as well. Like, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's you're, you're often using... Foxmark anyway so if, if anyone whether whether there's still a lot of people needing to crack high tag two things i don't know but there's there always seems to be chatter on on your <clears throat> discord channel about it so. I, I kind of ended up in this rabbit hole and key fob car key fobs cloning and it's it's a thing still so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> You end up somewhere, and I, I, I try to explain to people how I always say that RFID hacking is a very, very deep rabbit hole, and you know, once you stop falling into it, you never know when you end. I haven't hit bottom yet, so I'm, it, I keep on falling into this hole, and I find it excessively, and I find it extremely rewarding to, to, to look into, and that's why I make these videos, and I'm, I'm super happy that you could join and talk about it, and you know, I want to give you credit credit is due you made some amazing implementations cool thanks very much i think you've done a brilliant job as well i think what you've done is taken i mean i tried to do it for foxmark and i couldn't do it and and we've worked together on it and struggled but you've managed to make it work so congratulations man oh thank you well let's see what we can do and maybe we can inspire other people to do you know to lift up the gauntlet and you know and take things further right yeah maybe they'll get the sniffing to work better that would be something that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll be honest. I I often cheated and used a USRP. No, on radio. <laughs> it's easier. It's easier to decode it and get uh, clean traces. I, I bought an it's like car cloning thing, and I like this high tech three point one version. I thought of it, be able to sniff it, and it turns out that they don't use keys in that sense. But you just have a default key, then you have to type in your own key. I'm like, what the fuck am I going to use this for? <laughs> <laughs> anyway kevin thank you so very much for joining us and that would be all for this video today and let me know in the comments below and make sure that you follow the good old kevin on twitter and make sure you know you sh if you see him give him a beer or buy him a beer i tell you that he so much deserves awesome thanks very much thank you all bye bye